good. So yes, we... <laughs> yes, I Let's go to Revelation 17. That's where we kind of started with 17 last week. I do have slides, so let me see if I can share my slides. Um... Okay, hopefully you can see all that. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to go through all of the slides that all of the slides that we, I have on here, but we're going to talk about this image of Daniel again. I want to show specifically when we talk about Babylon and the Roman Empire and things. We will look to that. Uh, but our text, let me see where can I find our text. Let's, I'm going to read the text first, and uh, it, I think it's there. There it is. Good. Hopefully you all can see that. So let's read. Revelation 17, verse 1. We read it last week, but I'm just going to read it again. I'm going to go into more detail. And the more and the more I read, and the more I prepare, I just know there's so much. And we can really go into this for weeks if we want to. But obviously, you don't want to exhaust every... every um, uh, every one of you, <laughs> but let's, let's look at this. It says, uh, verse one, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. Now we spoke about that last week with whom the Kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality and with the wine and whose sexual immorality, the dwellers on the earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit to, into the wilderness, um, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. I think the King James might say dragon, or be, as a beast. And what's the uh, NIV beast? Okay, sorry. Uh, sitting on the scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, uh, and it had seven heads and ten horns. There's a clue there. And then verse 4. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with golden jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of the sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon, the great mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. Now, we want to talk about this. I want to probably end tonight with the mystery of Babylon. So we'll talk, we'll go in there and that's a topic on its own. We can really go into the depth. So verse six, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Christ. Okay. So let me see my notes where we ended. I think we, stood, we uh, went into, uh, if I can quickly remind us back to verse, the chapter 16, that says that there will be an earthquake and the islands will be leveled, the mountains will, that's the seventh bowl judgment. Because of all the weather changes and things, there will be <coughs> thunders and lightning and all these topical, uh, topographical changes that will happen, <clears throat> which we also find in Zechariah 14, Luke chapter 3. So I'm not going to go too much into that. And then chapter 17, I've, I've labeled it the destruction of Babylon chapter 17 and 18. Although we're going to talk about Babylon, we should always remember that it's a, I would say, broader than just the city and the political system and all those things. It includes a lot of, and, and we will talk about the, the, the revived Roman Empire as well, because I think it all is uh, included in that. So, um, Yes, yeah, so we spoke about here that Babylon, the city who represents a certain industry as Hollywood re represents a certain industry and Rome, uh, into, uh, the, we think of Rome, we think of the Roman Catholic Church and Babylon in this kind of as a symbol of the satanic deception and power. And when we think about Jerusalem, we think of a city of, of God. So we have this kind of, Two opposites, city of Babylon, the ungodly, and the city of Jerusalem, the godly kind of that idea. So I think that's also the reason for the use of, of Babylon, but we'll go into more detail. 
Now, the, the vision that we find, and, and, and I said chapter 17 is, is broken up into two parts. Chapter 17, verse 1 to 6 is, a, is the vision that John has. And then verse 7 onwards is the explanation. It's the explanation of that vision. So we spoke about a little bit about Babylon, the women, uh, uh, the mother of prostitutes, and what it represents. It represents false religion. Um, it represents all these deception and, and the things that goes with it. The Old Testament, the image of a prostitute was um, used to denote religious unfaithfulness when Israel walked away from God after the pagan idols and worship idols. They, um, they were like the unfaithful women also pictured. And uh, when God uh, said how he feels, about Israel, about he would say when, when Israel was at the right relationship with him, they're like a young woman, and he expresses that. You can go and read what is Wichlik, Songs of Solomon, I think. It explains kind of that picture of a man and woman, but it's God's relationship with Israel. And then also, uh, when they go away, they like the unfaithful, they almost like the harlot or a prostitute described. So that picture is familiar to us in the Old Testament as well. But now in the New Testament, this false religious system is pictured as a prostitute, as, as the harlot that is seated on many watches. And I just, I did mention that on epi can also be translated in Greek with beside the waters and that my picture might not be the best one explaining, but that the waters can represent the nations and the people of the world and that, that she's uh, um, sitting on this beast and uh, besides, as Babylon had waters and candles in that day uh, when the city existed still. So yes, um, I think we, we were, were talking about that. We spoke about the woman that represents false religion. And I, I went into a little bit of a side a rabbit trail with Nimrod, the founder of Babel. Maybe, oh, well, it is actually irrelevant. So let me not say it's a rabbit trail. Uh, with Nimrod, was the founder of the Babel, Babel and the Hebrew Babel, word Babel, the, te- the gate of God. Um, Bab meaning gate, and El meaning God. And, uh, and the people literally wanted to build a gate to God, uh, a tower to heaven. Um, basically, very good sermon. We cannot do it in our own strength. And God just turned that into um, judgment and he confused all the languages. And then I, s- I spoke about um, uh, Nimrod's grandson, Ham. If you can remember Ham. In Hebrew, it's Ham, uh, which basically reveals that his heart was darkened because although God sh- shone his light of heaven on him, uh, and granted him so many mercies, he still um, just uh, had a dark, dark and hold. And in a sense, from there on, uh, we had false worship as well. And uh, because people's hearts are darkened. So that, a message that I just made, said last week, and I think we ended there, is that it's very dangerous to be under the preaching and the light of the gospel and your heart is darkened and you don't respond positively. It, it's not a good place then to be. It's dangerous to be there because um, you'll be hardened in your sin and your conscience will be, be able quiet over time. And then you will think you, because you go to church, you are safe, but you're living a sinful life and, and, and that's very dangerous. So I think that's, that's where we ended last week. So let me, let me jump in then here and say, I think what we concluded, what we concluded is, that the woman sitting on the beast represents false religious system. So I think that we can uh, say with, with, with certainty. It's a false religious system and it's supported by the beast, which represents the political power, the, the antichrist world religion rule or whatever it's going to take form. But that uh, religious system will be supported by political power of the beast. Okay, so what is this religious system then? How does it look like? That's the question I want to go deep, dive deep into. What is this this, um, prostitute representing as a false religious system? And it's important because on her head is written, 
Babylon. And why Babylon? And I think this, it's, it's important clues for us to understand. And I don't think the Bible is unclear. I think the Bible gives us enough info. So to get to a conclusion, um, what this religious system probably will be like and look like and what is happening. And in, in actual fact, if we know this, you will see around you what's going on in the world today. It's actually in the process and uh, the stage is being set. So, so we'll, we'll talk about that. So let me, let me halt here for a second and ask you guys, what do you think is the religion, false religious system um, that is, will be supported by this political beast, the Antichrist? What do you think? Well, satanic will probably be satanic, but what do you think it will look like? Do you have any idea? Greg? So, Rudy, for, from my side, I think that they will, they will sort of preach that self-promotion is good and self-will is, is the right thing to follow your instincts and to live your life to the fullest because you only have one, so do whatever makes you happy. Human that rights. Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Good. I think you said the same thing now. Yeah, religion of self. Religion of basically self-fulfillment and <coughs> becoming a god or something like that, because that's the sat sat Satan desire he has for million, for thousands, not millions, thousands of years. He wants to be God. But anyways, any other add-ons? Any other comments on what you think is this Babylon it's talking about? Or this prostitute. Where's all my speakers? Let me see if I can press your buttons. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, yes. I think kind of the the direction um, it would go if if we. <clears throat> I mean, if we're thinking, you know, um, Satan would we kind of promote this at you know humans becoming gods, then I think it sounds pretty much like new age type thinking. I also think, yeah. I think it's all so intertwined, all these things. So big network. Uh, I, I, I know a pastor in, in Bloemfontein, well, he's, he's over 70 already now, and I used to, to learn a lot from him. And he used to say, it's, it's, it's very interesting how these things are all connected. If you pull a string here, something else pops up there because they are all kind of connected. And the, the master brain behind it, obviously, is Satan himself, who is, is the master or brain behind, I would say, all religions of the world, except the true religion, because he wants to deceive people. So, yeah, I would agree with that. So, let me... Let me let me jump into it because I, I I'm just touching basically on the surface and I think there's so much to, to talk about in this, but the it's interesting if you go and look at history, you'll find that the leaders of the Reformation, okay, Martin Luther and the Reformation, you'll find that they believed the woman who sits on the beast is the Roman Catholic Church. That was what they believed. They preached it. Now, most Protestants over the years re later on rejected that view. Okay, um, but we simply cannot ignore this question: What is this religious system? And I think when we look at this vision that John has, he sees this prostitute on the beast. It's kind of the focus is on the woman. It's not on the beast itself. He just say, he does say that the, woman, the beast has seven heads and ten, um, seven, ten horns, yes. He does say that, but the focus is on the woman herself. And I think that's, that's what he, uh, and we'll get the explanation also. So it's unquestionably, very important figure in the last days for two chapters actually before the coming of Jesus is this woman now but but before we try and answer this question I want to show you again that picture um, of and I want to go back to Daniel back to Daniel if you can remember hopefully 
you've come with us all the way and you've been with us when we did the book of Daniel. It'll make it a lot, will make a lot easier for me to explain. But if you don't, please, you can just stop me and we can talk about this again. So I'm going to go back to uh, this picture. Okay, so all rem you, most of you remember this image when we spoke about this. It's Daniel 2 when, when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. And then Daniel comes and he interprets the dream for, for Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, whatever. So the, the four different metals we see in this image represents four different empires. And it's been over and over in Daniel 7, Daniel 11, then uh, 9, 8, 9. It's been, it's been referred to as the four, the lion, the, uh, what is that? Sorry? The bear, the eagle. Leopard and yeah, I can use some time in so long. Crowd was a part. I look in all the good news. Peter said, Okay, you've got the picture, that's why I thought I'm my mind is losing me, anyways. So, the four different um empires that this image represents Babylon, the Medo Persians, the Gracian, and the Roman Empire, the le the, the, the steel legs, iron legs, steel, iron, yeah. So history shows us then, and we can talk a lot about this because some people say this, it's impossible for anyone to have predicted this. This book must have been written after the facts. And uh, we know as believers, it's, it, this, the, there's simply no evidence that it was written after, but rather, rather this book was written during the Babylon, uh, Babylon when, the, when the captive in Babylon. And that proves that God is the author of this book because it, it, the, the detail of, of fulfillment of these things in history, it just proves that God knew, knows the history and of the future. So history shows us that these empires succeeded one and, um, after another in that order. Babylon first, the head of gold, Medo Persian, uh, is the is the Easter, no? silver. So sorry, Gratian is the bronze, and Romans are the iron. So that represents those four, and they succeeded one after the other. Now you can talk about the Medo and Persian that they invaded Babylon and they basically um, threw Babylon over, but I'm not going to go in all that history. Now, there are many great empires in the history of, of the world. There are more than just mentioned here, but the Bible, it wasn't necessary for the Bible to mention them because they do not play any role in biblical prophecy and specifically when it comes to the end time. So the Bible gives us what we need to know, and there's, there's one empire that we will see will be revived, the Roman Empire, and Rome will again be the controlling power of this new world. So let me see. I think there's a there's, there's a question or chat there. Um, this is from Lewis. What about all the non-Western religions like Islam, Hinduism, etc.? Now I'm going to say something about them later on. So yes, they will be forming part of the of the one world religion um okay but we'll get to to that when i get there good so um okay so hopefully you can remember this picture we spoke about it and um just to say according to what daniel saw and according to daniel 2's explanation rome will be uh let me take you back to the picture Lost my share button now. Just to show you again. Um, can I turn this picture around now? Yeah. Okay, just to show you that again. As I've tried to put this picture in proportion to the timeline that of the diagram. Or the top obviously it doesn't really do justice, but obviously the point is that Daniel 2 talks about a stone that will be come loose that will 
destroy all these kings, the ten, ten kings and the, uh, the ten toes, basically, and the whole image is destroyed. There will be nothing left of it. And that's um, basically um, Daniel chapter 234. I actually have the scripture on later on. Um, it says, as you looked, a stone was cut off by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and it broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So that's important. Just remember that. That's very important. Sorry, I just want to say to America, you will not be the greatest nation in the future. Sorry about that. You can all can already see, even today, how America is falling apart. It's biblical prophecy being fulfilled. Okay, sorry. China and Russia, I've got bad news. You will also not be the greatest nation in the world. Although that is what they're trying to do, the Bible says the Roman Empire will be. The Roman Empire will be this great... In, um, revival of that in um, the end time. So, again, uh, there's the picture. You can look at that. Uh, the legs are from, uh, represents Rome, and the ten toes, obviously, the ten kings. And uh, it's important that we look at the details. Now, the two legs, the two legs of this image. Do, do you have the picture before you? Let me just see. No, you don't have the picture before you. Just to leave it before you so you can see. So the two legs of the image suggests that Ro the Roman Empire will be divided. And so it was. If you look at history, the Roman Empire politically and religiously, religion was divided in two. Okay, so it was divided into the east and the West. So if you know a little bit of history, I'm not a historian, I don't know too much, but in 3030 AD, we all know Constantine, you've heard about him, he becomes kind of a type of the Antichrist, and we'll talk about that later, but Constantine, he founded the city Constantinople, which today it is Istanbul, okay? That's Istanbul, it's Constantinople. And he, what, when he did that, he left the Bishop of Rome in charge of the West and he went to the East. And because of that, later on, the empire was divided and this final division came in um, the year 1054 um, with the religious side when the Orthodox Church and in the East and the Roman Catholic Church in the West divided, okay? Pope Leo IV then excommunicated Michael, this is the name I have, Cerularius, okay? So maybe you can fact check me, I don't know, Google it, see if I'm right. But I found this source um, from Dave Hunt. And um, Pope Leo, Leo IV, uh, he excommunicated this guy, Michael uh, Cerularius, who was the patriarch at, uh, of Constantinople. So then this division remains until today. Okay, so we have the Orthodox Church, we have the Roman Catholic Church, which was basically part of Rome, the Roman Empire. Now the political side of Rome, uh, the empire was revived many times in the West, but it, it died altogether then over history. Now, I don't have dates and, and when that happened and all things, but it altogether died. Um, apparently, remember we spoke about the horn that was, uh, the head that was wounded, and it was, it seemed to be wounded. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's going to be revived again. So, representing that. So, only the religious side, side basically grew larger and extend it to the world. And today, um, some of the numbers, I googled it, hopefully Google is, is fine with the numbers. Uh, today, they are estimated to be 1.2 billion Roman Catholics in the world. Okay, that's 
that's a lot. And almost half of them is so named, and I'm calling named Christian because not everyone who says they're a Christian are truly born again. So half that, that 1.2 billion is half of the so named Christian world in the world. So you can say half of Christianity, in, if I take it in a broader sense, and not in the true Christian understanding as the church, the true church of Christ, but Christian in broader sense, half of them are Roman Catholics, 1.2. Okay, it's not, I'm not saying that there are no true believers in, in the Catholic church, I'm not saying that, but uh, I doubt, as I've said before, if you truly saved, if you really will continue and stay in the Roman Catholic Church. That's, that's what I think. So East, Eastern Orthodoxy is less than half as many. So you can take the other, the other half and the 25%. That's 25%. And, the, you know, the other 50% divided into 25% of them are Eastern Orthodox. Okay, that's the numbers I'm getting. Maybe I'm wrong. Someone can check me and see if I'm wrong. I'll be open for, for correction. But obviously, when the Antichrist is going to rule, he's going to heal this broken relationship between the two. So we need to understand when there's a one world religion, he's, he's probably he's going to have to heal this relationship between the two legs that has been divided over well, centuries. And, um, and then the Protestants consist of the rest, okay? And we know from the Protestant side, there are so many different denominations. Now, I don't know how many. I think I've read sometimes something like 3,000. I'm not sure if I'm correct. Maybe I'm wrong. But, but from Revelation 13 verse 8, we saw that all the people on the earth will worship the beast. Okay, except for the true believers, but all the people of the world will worship the beast. Now, that includes all religions. That maybe is the answer for, for Cynthia that she was asking. Including Roman Catholicism, including Eastern Orthodoxy, including Protest Protestants. Okay? They will all be united through the ecumenical movement. And we spoke about the ecumenism um, in one of our studies. They will be united through that. So the, the, the method or the thing that brings them, that will bring them together and heal them in that sense, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church, will be the ecumenical movement. And that's a very strong movement in the world today that we live in. They will also be united, not only Christianity, but also with other world religions to form this new world religion. So let's, let's start there. There will be a one world religion being formed with different churches, religions, whoever. Now I'm not talking about the true church, I'm not talking about the true believers of Christ. I'm talking in general about Let's say the false church. So this one false religion will be a mixture of false Christianity, paganism, as it was in Constantine's day. Okay, so that's why Babylon, and this is why Babylon is mentioned. Because the paganized form of Christianity started with Constantine. And eventually became what is known today as the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I do believe what they will that they will be a big role player in the final ecumenical union of religions. I do think that's what where the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope plays a big role. And we can see with even today with the statements that are, that are made by the Pope that that is what he seeks. Seeks. That is what he wants. He wants to unite all religions, obviously under Roman Catholic Catholicism, with his own agenda. But he's just a role player in all of this. Now, let's let's go back to the toast. So let me just stop there. I know I've said a lot. 
Is there any questions, any comments, any add-ons, any disagreements? Um, um, please, you can share. Okay, Greg, you can speak. With that picture, um, it has the gold head, the silver shoulders and arms, the bronze plate and the, the iron legs. But the feet and the toes are made of different materials. So how does that work that's going to be yeah. of it, an impact? It's, it's that. Okay, so there, there are many people who are guessing what it means. Many people who with their own interpretation, specifically the iron and the clay. Obviously, iron and clay doesn't mix. Okay? Yeah. So meaning it will be a false unity. It will be a false, it won't be a true uh, mix. Okay? Secondly, I think, I'm just, this is my opinion again. I think this is probably has to do with state and religion to church and politics how this and that's what is also being um being pictured with the woman and the beast religion and politics so we'll, we'll, we'll that that's what i think that's where my mind goes i'm not going to say exactly i know but that's what the, the clay and the iron that doesn't mix tells me i don't know maybe maybe someone else has got an idea um boss john i do buy studies or really good as john do you have an idea Uh, sorry, Rudy, at that particular point, I was being distracted by my dog who was busy consuming his foot. <laughs> so I, didn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't with it. No problem. Now, I was asking, uh, Greg asked the question about the toes that are made from iron and clay. And that, what, what that specifically mean. So I just said, I think, I'm not saying I know. I think that it represents obviously something that cannot mix, not supposed to mix. You cannot mix iron and clay. And, and, and secondly, I think it has to do with religion and politics. I don't know. Maybe you know something I don't know. Um, no, I'm not um, more aware, but that's, that sounds right to me because that is going to be the thing of the future. And that is where politics and um, the church are almost going to become one thing because it's yeah. going to be approved and managed by the state or the Antichrist. So, yeah, I yeah. think it's probably okay. right. So maybe, maybe we're right. Number two, yeah? If, yeah, it's a false union. It's, there's no way you can make religion and the state. But uh, obviously, that's how it's going to look like in, in the future. So, yes, yeah, so um, I want to go back to Daniel chapter 2 again and look at the 10 toes. So remember, the, oh, well, we're talking about the 10 toes, okay? But according to the interpretation that Daniel gives to Nebuchadnezzar, he says the following. And this is important because this just is another way of saying that because of the different, there are many different um, views when it comes to eschatology, the premillennium, the postmillennium, the amillennium, and people have different views on different things. I think this just gives me some arsenal in my artillery, is that the right word? Uh, in my arguments to show that what I think it's, it's the right paradigm when we, as we've gone through, through so many times. Okay, so let me just show you something. It says in chapter 2 verse <clears throat> Verse 44, it says, and in the days of those kings, important, underline those words, kings. Now, it's going to be 10 kings, okay, 10 toes. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms. So there are kings and there are kingdoms. And bring them to an end and it shall stand forever. Okay. So I've got, a, I've got a, an argument I want to share with you. <clears throat> um, obviously this 
this um, when Christ will come and set up a kingdom, God will, of heaven will set up a kingdom. We know this refers to Christ's kingdom. Okay, this kingdom of Christ will come, according to this verse, and destroy all the kingdoms and they will come to an end. Are we in agreement on that? Okay, Lizelle agrees. You agree. Some of you, do you agree? When Jesus comes, he will destroy all the kings. I've got some agreement there. Yeah. Sorry, Rudy. Remember the stone, the stone that will come loose and will destroy the image. Uh, yes, Greg? So, with it mentioning kings, so I know through history, the monarchies and men have got less and less and less. When they mention kings, is it actual monarchs that they're talking about? Or is it, because I know a kingdom can be a, a nation and type of thing on yeah. it, but if they're talking specifically kings, yeah. is that a monarch? Yeah, but or that, is it someone yeah. who's claiming to be a king? I, I, you see, I think when Daniel wrote this down, that's how it worked in, that day, in those days. They had kings and kingdoms. Okay? <laughs> So it would have not made sense to the reader to say president. It will be presidents. Okay. It wouldn't have made sense. Uh, but in our day, we call them maybe a president of a nation or, or ruler or a monarch. So it, it, I think that's, that's basically, so we must take in account when David wrote this, or Daniel wrote this, his frame of reference of describing this, was kings and as God revealed to him. So if God told him to write down president, Daniel would have been confused, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, um, so no, I think it's, because it's probably 10 king, kingdoms, 10 countries, I'm guessing. Maybe kingdoms can refer to some countries who are united in some alliance. We don't know. Some people, um, and when I was younger and when I did the eschatology studies, um, when I was in standard nine what is that grade 11 matric i did some of these uh, studies at our church uh, they spoke about the the european union as the 10 as the roman em, uh, revived roman empire now i don't know if that's true uh, they just lost england <laughs> and they're gonna lose a lot of, uh, of the western countries as well i don't know uh, uh, no yeah so anyways let's leave it there so, so it might not even be that. But the, the fact is, I think it's, we can agree with the fact when, with, with this verse, it says, God will set up a kingdom. It will destroy all the kingdoms. Nothing will be left. I think that's that we can all agree on. It shall break into pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end. So now the, it, this, this is important. And the reason I'm saying this is because there are different interpretations on this text on this image where people and let me give you the interpretation that i was taught when i studied theology on the university and this is the interpretation of what i would call a amillennial view where people don't believe in a literal thousand year millennial reign where they believe that the kingdom we also call it some people believe in the kingdom come kingdom now theology also uh, dominion theology and i'll explain it now so the reason I'm saying it is because according to this verse, there are kings, okay, and there are kingdoms that will be destroyed when Jesus comes. Now, in the history of the Roman Empire, they were never ruled by 10 kings, but the image has 10 toes representing 10 kingdoms or 10 kings. So, therefore, this prophecy can can impossibly um, refer to a historical event. It is something that is still future because there will come a day when the Roman Empire will be revived under 10 kings, ruled by the Antichrist. The dragon, with 10 heads, uh, ten, seven heads, 10 horns. And, I, and we spoke about seven and 10 because uh, three of them are taken out by the Antichrist. He kind of usurps, I think, three of them. And then he rules the rest. So anyway, it's not, not too technical. But um, let me quickly show you Revelation, uh, Daniel 
2 verse 30. I'm going to go back to Daniel 2.34 that um, explains also something that's important. Okay. It says, as you look, a stone was cut out by no human hand. It struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that, that, that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the interpretation that Daniel gives to Nebuchadnezzar because of the dream. Okay, So I think this clearly shows us that when the kingdom of Christ comes, all the other kingdoms are destroyed. Let's say all the kingdoms of the world, for that matter. There will be no kingdom left. Christ's kingdom will be set up. He will rule. That's, that's what I read there. But those who interpret that this stone that are um, cut out not by man, but struck the image, there are those, if you don't understand, a, if you don't believe in a premillennial view, premillennial meaning before millennial, Jesus comes before millennium, that's premillennial, that's what we call it, meaning Jesus Second coming will happen before the thousand year and he will set up his kingdom and reign. Okay. But if you believe in a millennial, meaning that there is no thousand year millennial, that we are living in that thousand symbolic kind of way, which is also kind of a uh, post millennial is very close to that. We are already living in the millennium. Okay. Then Jesus will come at the end of the millennium. So they view this thousand year as a symbolic or um, representation of the thousand years that we are, are living in. That's the, the view, the post and the amillennial view. Now, if that is true, then Daniel 2 doesn't make sense at all, okay? Because if uh, the, the view is this, and I'm going to tell you this view because I've been encountering so many people who don't believe in the rapture, who don't believe in the millennium, who uses this kind of uh, un, uh, explanation when I ask them about Daniel 2. They will say to you that the, the stone that came and struck, the stone is the church. So they will say, this is the kingdom of God. Struck the earth, and now the church will become a great mountain in the earth, and it will fill the whole earth. Now, it sounds right. Does it sound right? The church grew. Okay. And this is what is also called, and I said it before, kingdom now theology, meaning the kingdom is not coming when Jesus comes and sets up the millennial kingdom. It means that the kingdom already came. The kingdom is here now. That's what we call kingdom now theology. Now you get people in the middle of it who's confused, okay? They say, and I know there's a book we did in, in, in theology when I studied theology called from, um, kingdom now theology yet kingdom now kingdom yet from Ridderbos. Uh, honestly i wrote a whole paper um uh, refuting that book and uh, it was in our missionary missionary class and the lecturer was so glad that there's one person who can think for himself <laughs> so, uh, static you for me anyways so uh if you believe the kingdom already came I'm not talking about the spiritual kingdom that we are really already part of. I'm talking about confusing the matter of the millennial kingdom, saying that this is the kingdom that came. You also, it's very closely related to dominion theology. You know, dominion th theology says the church will take over the world, but not spiritually, but also politically. So you'll get a lot of the faith movement and, the, and those those kind of people who have a dominion theology, the latter day, uh, the latter reigns movement from the 70s, um, I can probably name a few. Um, that, uh, like, I think it's William Brom, 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 I can't even those. Anyways, those people who believe that the world will kind of infiltrate this, not, e not only people's lives and get them to salvation, but they will infiltrate all the countries and the governments. And so they've got a political agenda trying to 
to fill the earth and take over the earth. And then, only then, Jesus is coming. Jesus will come. So Jesus will come to a Christianized world. Okay? Um, that kind of conf contradicts everything we've said so far. With the end time, that's, things are getting darker and things are getting worse. And we can see that. It's not getting better. Um, Greg, sorry, I see your hand is up. I don't know how long you were waiting, but you can say, we can talk. Is the stone and busy. But then in Daniel 3.34, it doesn't say that the stone gradually broke down the kingdoms and stuff like that. It says that it, it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron and clay, the bronze and silver and the gold, all together were broken in pieces and became like chaff in the summer threshing floors and carried them all away yeah. in one time. And then the stone <coughs> became a great mountain. So if the people actually read what's written in they don't, the Bible, you can you can't even... come up with stuff like that. So, so Greg, I know I sent you my notes and you just said what I was going to say. But thanks for, for sharing that. Um, it's a pleasure. <laughs> I'm giving you the credit. Don't worry. You, you got it. And I'm so glad you saw that because this alone is just proving that the kingdom ha has not come. I'm not talking about we become born again and we're part of the kingdom of God in a general sense. I'm talking about the millennial kingdom. It hasn't come. And it it. If you understand that the church is the stone that will strike all the kingdoms of the world and destroy them over time, then it, you should understand it's going to gradually, just as, and I'm glad Greg used the word gradually because that's what in my notes is, meaning that it will gradually fill the earth and gradually take over. Now, this is simply not true. This is not what Daniel is saying. This is not the interpretation of Daniel. The text is clear. When God's kingdom comes, he will destroy the kingdoms of the world. No coexisting with other kingdoms. No gradual takeover of kingdoms. And let me add this. The Jews, because of the limited revelation, they didn't understand the mystery of the church, the mystery of the church age. They thought that's what Jesus is going to do. But if they knew the, if they understood Daniel 2 that says there are kings and the 10 toes that are representing 10 kingdoms, they would have known that there were no 10, there were no 10 kings that yet ruled when Jesus came. And that would have been a clue to them that this prophecy refers to the last days and not to when Jesus was uh, coming the first time so but they they would have known that but they missed that so when christ comes he will destroy and this is what it refers to the the antichrist and the ten kingdoms and he will then set up his millennial kingdom that just makes sense if you look at the if you look at the picture again and you look at our um diagram we've been studying this so long and i've showed you over and over and over this over again if you take out that church age idea, if you take that out, something doesn't add up then. Then it doesn't make sense. If you put um, the church here, if you put that stone, I, I think you're looking at this. If I put it there, where the stone, where Jesus came and filled the earth, then obviously all these texts, now I have to rearrange my stuff then. I'll have to take everything and change everything. It will simply not make sense. Simply not make sense. Okay. I just want to show you that that's just another arsenal in my argument to show you that I believe in premillennialism and the Bible supports that view. So all the scriptures supports that view. So also second, second um, Thessalonians 2 verse 8. Let me show you that one. Let's see if I can find it here. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 8 says, And then the lawless one will be revealed. Who is that? The Antichrist. Whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. But Jesus will destroy the beasts and the kingdoms 
and he will set up his kingdom. There's no contradiction there. Um, everything fits together, if you understand it this way. Now, the, the Antichrist will only be destroyed when Jesus comes. And we just, Jesus comes, a lot of things will happen. He will rescue Israel from her enemies. And again, the image has ten toes, and this ten toes are described in Daniel 7. So I'm going to go quickly to Daniel 7, verse uh, 24. It says, as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall rise. Now there's not, nowhere in the history of the Roman Empire that ten kings arise. So the ten toes. So we cannot prove that the Roman Empire is done with, it won't be revived. This is clearly end time language. It will arise and another shall arise after him. Who is that? The Antichrist. And he shall be diff uh, different from the former one and should put down three kings. That's where the ten and the seven comes in. I think we spoke about this at one stage. Okay. So now if you jump forward to Revelation 12 verse 3, we read about the dragon with the ten heads and the ten, ach, seven heads and the ten horns. And then Revelation 17, we read about that again. We know that the dragon is Satan himself. We know that the beast in Revelation 13 represents the, the Antichrist. And then uh, Revelation 12, let me quickly go back. It says in verse 7 to 9 that Michael the archangel and his angels fought against the dragon in heaven. So the dragon here in Revelation 12 is Satan himself. And then the beast from Revelation 13 verse 3 with seven heads um, is the, um, comes from the Roman Empire, Daniel 7. So the fourth empire, the Roman Empire, will be under his control, under Satan's control, directed by, to, through um, the Antichrist. In, and in Revelation 13.3, I've got this, the text here. Let me put it up. <clears throat> what was I now? Revelation 13, <clears throat> verse 3 says, One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. And we spoke about this, if you remember. It doesn't say it had a mortal wound. I know this scripture has been used with so many people and even movies, even the Escape the Rapture movies. What, what is that? Stay Behind movies and all those Left Behind movies, not Escape. Left behind, escape. The, if you want to escape the rapture, don't be saved. <laughs> okay. But left behind movies, it shows that, oh, the Antichrist was killed, and this is a, this is a, a, a copy resurrection, kind of trying to, re, to copy Jesus. Now, I don't think so. I think this mortal wound that seems to be wounded is the Roman Empire that seems to be dead, but it will be healed. And the whole world will marvel as they follow the beast. Okay, so that, that's what makes sense to me. Um, I am stand corrected if I'm wrong. But so far, that's how I understand it. <clears throat> okay, so some believe, as I said, okay, I've spoken about that. <clears throat> okay, any questions before I continue? We can go for a little. Sure. Let's see if we can finish up. Um, or everything. Any questions? Does it make sense to you? Am I confused? Am I confused? I am a confused person, but not. I'm talking about what, this. Greg? <clears throat> so really, if we can understand this, why do non-believers not understand it? That's what I'm confused about. <clears throat> because you must understand non-believers, they obviously don't have an interest in the Word of God. And secondly, uh, they don't understand the spiritual things, the natural things, as Paul says in Corinthians. Uh, it's spiritually um, discerned. So if you're not born again, you're going to have a, a little bit of a trouble to read the Bible. It's going to be difficult. Some of you might remember before you got saved, the Bible was also very difficult to read and understand, except through the Holy Spirit revealing truth of, yourself, of salvation to you and what Jesus did. Um, and convicting you of your sins and, and of righteousness and judgment and those things. But obviously, if, as a non-believer, if a non-believer studies the Bible, he's going to think it's crazy. So he, how, many, how many Christians look at Revelation and say, oh, I don't want to read the book. It's so confusing. 
Ephesians 4, 18 says they are darkened in their <coughs> Yeah. Yeah, Glazelle says Ephesians 4 verse 18 says that sinners, those who are, are dead in their sins, um, are darkened in their understanding. So, yeah, so it, it starts with being saved and, and allowing the Holy Spirit also to reveal the truth. And you don't get everything from day first when you're a Christian baby, you grow. And some, I've, I've, uh, we had a, a webinar for the Baptist Union Assembly yesterday and even dr martin pullman who's been the principal and he was the president years ago he's the principal of the co of the college he's, he's he's aged and i think he's in his late 60s 70s probably um that he he says there are scriptures that he's been he has struggled for 30 40 years be before he could understand it and and that's just how god works with us there's there's there will always be something more to learn from the Bible and to dig into and to get uh, more. We will never get to the end of all the knowledge of, of Christ. So, yeah. <clears throat> Anyways, the other is my boy still for now. So, Greg, you had all the static you had, you had some more. Your brain work, COVID did nothing in your brain. Your brain work, mooi. Okay. Um, was I, no, that's my plug for that. Okay, so let's let's just look in ancient Roman, and I think when we get to the woman on the on the beast sitting on the beast, and we understand all of the background, things will become clearer, and we will understand it. So, if you go back to ancient Roman, because the Roman Empire, according to my understanding, I believe is the correct understanding, the Ro empire will be revived in ancient Rome. Images of Caesar were, was put up and people were made to worship and bow before the image. Is it the same in the end days? Exactly. What, what did we read in Romans 13? The beast will make an image and make the people to worship it. It's the same thing. Okay, so the emperor, emperor worship will again be the religion of the world. So this one world religion will be an emperor worship religion. The Antichrist will be the emperor. The emperor, the beast, will make them worship him. And although he will be a political figure, he will also desire the worship of people. Now, if you go back, Satan, what did he do when he tempted Jesus in Matthew 4 in the wilderness? He said, if you fall down before me, I'll give you all this kingdom. And if you worship me. Do you think that the devil is going to do it with the kings of the world? He's going to tell him, if you fall down before me, I'll give you the world. And then the ten kings will probably arise because of that. So I, I don't think the ten kings, uh, they probably live today. I don't know. They might live today. But I don't think uh, in an official way they are already in place and the ten kings are appointed, if you want to say that. I don't think so. But they will arise in the last days. And, uh, and that's what, that is what Revelation 17 is re representing. It's representing a one world religion, the woman sitting on the back of the dragon who's controlling the world through the Antichrist. Uh, on the back of the beast, sorry, the Antichrist. So the ancient world empires, the uh, if you if you study that, you will know that the emperors had close, at very close advisors, and they were the priests, they were the sorcerers, they were the magicians, the soothsayers. Okay, um, remember Pharaoh? He had magicians, probably in a secret way controlling everything happening in the in the country. Okay, so. I think it will be the same way. There will be a renewed interest in spirituality in the last days. And it will gain momentum. Many will people, according to Jesus, Matthew 24, verse 4, will um, be, will, um, there will be many false Christs. They will be led astray. And this, let me say it this way. The world will not become more and more atheistic or secular the world will become more and more religious 
but not not true biblical christianity i'm talking about religious more spiritual satan's weapon is not his best weapon he has is not atheism atheism his best weapon is <laughs> Lizelle. Lizelle says facebook it's not facebook Lizelle. his best weapon is false religion and that is what the woman on the beast represents okay so the antichrist will also pretend to be christ he will come in the place that's what anti means anti means against or in the place of okay in greek so his followers will be who wants to guess i've actually put a, a question mark there who wants to guess who the followers of the antichrist will be greg I can't hear you. you. I see your mute is off, but I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Um, I'll take a stab at it. I was going to ask something else, but uh, the, the followers will be deceivers. Okay. What What did you want to ask before that? So, uh, you said that it'll be like emperor worship again would that mean that the the dragon who had seemed to have a, a mortal wound will he then become the one that will be worshipped like an emperor yeah the, well the false prophet and revelation 13 will make the world worship the beast after the dragon so the false prophet the beast he will probably set up these images and he will enforce the mark of the beast and uh, I've discovered what is the mark of the beast. It's ivermectin. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said it. Because it's the mark of the beast. It's beast. Okay, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm using ivermectin, so I'm just joking. Anyways. Um, um, no, no, no. And I took myself. Okay. Uh, chapter 13. The beast will make an image. He will make the people worship this image and he will make them take the vaccine no he will make them take the mark of the beast by the way it's not the vaccine because it's on your right arm and on your forehead and i've not seen anyone being injected in the forehead or in the right hmm. it's on the left arm if i'm correct i'm sh i don't know maybe i don't know <laughs> anyways so so yes it's not it's not that so that's what the beast will do um so this antichrist will pretend to be christ so his followers will be christians and i'm saying named christians just in front of it so that you don't get confused between true believers of christ and christian in general as his name as kind of your your senses form that you fill in i'm a christian because I live in a Christian country, my mom and dad was a Christian kind of house. It's not that. So let me say this. It's not going to be communism that will take over the world. So relax, China will not take us over. Okay? It is Christianity that will take over the world. But Pastor, you just said that we're not going to take over the world in Daniel. Okay? But it's a false Christianity. It's a counterfeit Christianity. And don't be surprised that the people who are promoting kingdom now theology and people who are promoting that Christians will take over the world and the politics, that they are actually playing the role into this false Christianity, counterfeit Christianity. And I'm throwing out a, a, a shooting there, general. So I don't want to go into detail, but we are not uh, going, we, the church is not going to take over the world, okay? But false counterfeit Christianity will because they will follow the anti in the place of Christ. And the way they will do that is through the ecumenical movement. And the union between religions, Christianity, and let me throw in one day, evangelicals, even evangelicals. And we see a move in the world today away from true biblical Christianity, even under among evangelicals, which is sad. They're going liberal, they're going completely unbiblical they believe so many 
you are bracing a lot of things that's just simply sad. It's just sad to see what's going on. Now, the unity, this unity among religions is not the unity that we spoke about on Sunday when we spoke about uh, what Paul said in Ephesians 4, the unity that is built on truth and the unity that is built because we are one body, one spirit, one Lord, one hope. Not that unity. This unity will be built upon social justice, peace, commonwealth, global peace. Those are the things that they will try to unite um, the, the religions. Now, very interesting, and I want to sh throw this in here. You not buy him to say. Um, anti, anti in Latin, the word antichrist, but the word anti in Latin means vicar. Go and study, check me up on Google. Boss Lisa, say like it to my tidin. Lisa, go check me on Google, Google Translator if I'm correct. Vicar, <clears throat> vicarious. <clears throat> and antichrist is vicar of Christ. Now, very strangely, I'm not saying this, but it's just a fact. It's very strange why the Roman Catholic popes call themselves the vicar of Christ. Why would you call yourself the anti of Christ? I don't get it. Okay, the vicar of Christ. And they've done so for centuries. In fact, they are calling themselves antichrists. That's what they do. So guess where they inher inherited this title from? Who wants to guess? Where did they get this term vicar from? Lisa says, whichever are you, arm um, you don't write. <laughs> if you write, if you write, you go for the injection on the left. Okay, thanks for that, Lisa. I didn't know that. <laughs> So it's it's not a left or a right thing. Yeah. So it can't be anyways, Mark of the Beast, because of that. I've actually got a video today. And I listened to it 10 seconds and just put it off because the word Mark is spear and that represents the needle. <laughs> I was, couldn't believe people believe that. Anyways, <clears throat> I'm seeing the numbers are getting less, so I'm talking nonsense. Who left us? Oh, goodness. Okay. Anyways, um, so the word antichrist uh, comes, or vicar of Christ, comes, was originated with Constantine. Constantine in 325 AD, okay, the first ecumenical council was held by Constantine, okay. Constantine was not interested in biblical truth. But he wanted to unify the empire. He wanted to bring them all together. So what he did, he stopped Christian persecution. And Christians said, oh, this is a very nice guy. So they, he became the head of the Christian church because of that. And he called himself the vicar of Christ, in the one in place of Christ. But he also became head of the pagan priesthood called the Pontifex Maximus, okay? And interesting, and I didn't know this, I found it out today, that there are three titles that um, the Pope, Rome, the Popes give them, um, as still remain until today. Yep. They retain these three titles for the Pope. Uh, let me say that. So let me, before I say that, Constantine is kind of this prototype of the Antichrist who is yet to come, who has an empire where he took Christianity, uh, paganized it, and also was the emperor. And that's the kind of idea that we have in, in, the, in the last days. So the popes have these three titles called Constantine Pontifex Maximus. That's the one title, which is a pagan, pagan um, uh, name, head of the pagan priesthood. Secondly, they call themselves Vicar of Christ, which means Antichrist. And thirdly, they call themselves Bishop of Bishops. Okay. So it's, it's interesting. I just found it out today. And anyways, when I read it. So the popes claim absolute power over the kingdom, over the people, and over, the, over property. But they were corrupted. When they, when, they, when they did this, we know the Middle Ages and all, and all the years, they did this, uh, of course, because of that, 
there were reaction and then the reformation happened we all know the reformation in the 15th 16th century and the creeds identified the creeds identified them as the antichrist so you can now understand why the reformed leaders saw the catholic church and the pope as the antichrist as this woman riding on the beast because of uh, the, the the titles they have and because they were so corrupt and, and because they wanted absolute power over the world okay okay that's fine uh, so the question is how did this woman so i'm not saying i'm not i'm putting this out there i'm not saying it is the pope or it is the roman catholic church i think it's broader than that it's the ecumenical um uh, movement where all religions are together but they will be playing a role in into that so the question is how did this woman and this is an interesting question how did this woman get to sit on a dragon on a fearsome dragon uh, we've seen so many movies of uh, what's it what's a movie from uh, how to train a dragon how they had to train their dragon to sit on their back okay so how did they how did this woman get to sit on this fearsome dragon? Why would the dragon allow her to sit on him? Okay. And she will be playing this major role in the revival of the Roman Empire and the reign of the Antichrist. Okay, let me go. I'm going to put the scripture up there. We will be finished in a, not in a short time. So please bear with me a little bit. Uh, please just bear with me. Let me talk about Diane Cry. Okay, so let's go to verse 4. Verse 4 to 5 and 6. I just want to read it again. So the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and impurities of the sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery. Babylon the great mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of jesus okay so i want to read that again so i want to talk about quickly and we'll go into this next week the what i call the mystery of babylon what is written on a forehead why is that written on a forehead babylon the great mother of prostitutes and the earth's abomination so we we talked about in chapter 16 about the city that i believe i said it i I do believe it's a literal city because it's going to split in three. It's going to be destroyed by the earthquake. And yeah, yes, and, I, and I've said that. But here we have the mystery, the name of Babylon written on her, on, on her forehead. What does it mean? What does it all mean? So uh, if you can remember, I mentioned Saddam Hussein. Okay. I, I, the poor guy died 2006, if I'm correct. I, I thought he might have been still alive, but he died. But he tried to rebuild Babylon. And the reason why he tried to build, rebuild Babylon is because Saddam Hussein believed he was the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know if you knew that. I found the source. I believe the source is good. So he believed he was the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. It's in... Dave Hunt's book called The Woman Rides the Beast. So I, I read it there and he's, he, he talks about this. He also wanted to destroy Jerusalem and take the Jews into captivity into Babylon. He was playing Nebuchadnezzar. He thought it was probably his purpose. So I, although I still think that Babylon is a literal city being destroyed, um, well, I don't know what it might be named today. We don't know. Uh, it might be called something different. But the question is, what, what does it mean on her head? Why is it written there? And, and we'll go into this next week more in detail. I think it, ref in short, I think it refers to the union between the king or the emperor and the priest that was a common thing in Babylon. Okay? The toes, that's why I said the toes of iron, maybe the political side and the clay, the, the religious side. I'm guessing, I'm guessing that um, might be that mixture that it represents. And now we have this prostitute, false religion, but she's got the name of Babylon written on her head. So there's a union between the, that it represents between um, politic and religion, priest and prince uh king and magician sorcerers 
They were the pagan priests and magicians and sorcerers. They were the close advisors of the king. And in some way, they have a hidden influence in the king's affairs, influencing control over the, um, controlling the empire. And this woman is kind of controlling the beast. She's sitting on the beast. She probably like a pet, like a horse. You are controlling. She's sitting on this beast and she's probably controlling him in a, yeah, in a very hidden way, mystery way. I don't know. So that's, I think that's what it means. And that she will be in bed with both secular governments and spiritual entities. I hope that makes sense because that's what makes sense to me. She will be in bed with both of them. So, that is why I personally believe as a pastor of a church and as a, as a minister of the truth and, and um, of the Bible that a minister should not be involved in politics. Just my opinion. I know some people think differently. They want to be, uh, to influence the government with, in, in a Christian way. That's not wrong. I'm not saying that. But as a pastor, my concern, my focus is to feed the flock of God and not try to change the government. I can pray for them. I should pray for them, as the Bible says. But this is what she will, this, uh, okay, I'm making a, a, a not, not really a comparison, but the fact is this prostitute will be in bed with the government and with spiritual entities. She will have adulterous relationships with both politics and religion. And the unity of church and state, as it existed in the days of Babylon, will again be the, the, the status quo. Meaning that, and, and this is one, one um, Baptist principle for those, those who've done the membership class. We talk about the separation of church and state. That's what happened with the Reformation. That's what happened with the Protestant movement, where the Baptists simply said, the affairs of the church should not be ruled by the government and the government should be ruled by government officials. And we have both a function in this world and we should pray for the government. They should do their work. They should bring justice in the world. We should pray for them. We should also adhere to the, to the um, um, submit under their rule for, for peace and for safety in, the, in, in civilization and in the communities. Okay. But that's their work. The government's work is not to Christianize the country. Their work is to, to bring justice and um, practice justice in the world. The church work is to bring people to Christ and to get people saved and feed them the word of God. That's our work. And we shouldn't bring those together. So the Baptists have that separation of church and state. But in the new world religion, political arena, there will be a unity between them. And I think this lady on the beast represents that, controlling the political. So in the old days, I don't want to get too much political, but in the old days, let's be honest, there was a church in South Africa that controlled the politics with their theology of apartheid. Let's be honest, let's name it. They controlled a lot of things in South Africa. Okay, so I'm going to end there. Any last comments from you questions from you please do john just let me know they lost signal so that's why they left they didn't leave because they're mad with something i said <laughs> okay so priscilla has got a question okay i'll i'll go in deep more de depth i'm gonna i didn't check it up but I'll see if I can find something. Okay. There was something Lizelle said that we, I said I will maybe come back to it to this week. I can't remember. I, I forgot. Maybe some of you can remember something we spoke about and I said I'll go and look into it. But I, I, I just can't remember. Demos, my brain is the brand. <laughs> COVID, no, it's not COVID. It's other mechanism. My brain. You need to write things down. Really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rizal actually does. She's got a notebook in her Bible. She must write, just write it down. Anyways, anything from you guys? Anything that you want to add? A question you have? Anything that is unclear? Please ask the. It's half past eight. I can still answer a question if you want. 
the lows I are... yes <clears throat> yeah um i was just wondering ecumen uh, i can't even say the word ecumen ecumenical. Ecumenical. yeah um <clears throat> how does it differ from um biblical unity um because i've heard it being used like as as a well Maybe I just didn't, didn't fully in understand broad, it. In a broader sense, some people, the lines between biblical unity and ecumenical is very distorted. I think that that's where it becomes difficult. We should pursue biblical unity, but not to the expense of truth. That's what I'm saying. Okay. That's, that, that's what I'm yeah. saying. Biblical unity is based on truth. And we spoke about uh, yeah, the so, so two sermons, last two sermons, what biblical unity is. If if it is just for something else, the motive behind it is to bring other things, global peace, common good, well, and those, those kind of things. Those are not the things that, those are things that, that other religions also seek. They want also, mm. peace. they want also, so we can find a lot of things to agree on with other religions, but that's not the things that unite us as church. Okay. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Maybe the, maybe this is a question. I want, uh, let me ask this because we spoke about this not long too long ago. What 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 if uh, a few guys like the Muslims and the Islams, ah, oh, Muslim is Islam, <laughs> the Muslims and the Hindu and a, and and let's say Christian, three guys come together and say, "Listen, we're not happy with our town. It's very dirty. Let's clean it up. Let's put all our resources together." And clean out the street streets and fill the, the holes in the street. Should we do that as a church? Let me put that out there. I don't know. I don't have the answer. Let me hear what you guys say. Hmm. Well, that's a good question. <clears throat> um, Israel was commanded to work for the um, you know the the growth of the country that they get exiled to. Um, but I don't know if that, if that would give us any guidance. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, we, I think it's important that it's not as, uh, that the distinction should be made. It's not a spiritual thing that we work together. It's, yeah. simply, it's simply a common social thing, but, but we can't pray together. That's, that's where I would draw the line because people say, no, we must pray together. Even if you're a Muslim. That's that's just completely. I don't pray together because we don't pray to the same God. So, um, Lewis. Yeah, Rudy. I was going to say that you you can get together and do a community project. You yeah. just can't do it under a, a religious name umbrella. I think that's that's where I would draw the line. So if it's called a community project, I will join in. I mean, yeah. there's been a few damn cleanups now, even in our state where the we all get together and you know, probably most of the people staying here, I, I see them every Sunday when I go to church and come back, they're still at home. They don't go to church. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm just saying there's a lot of people here I don't think are saved or Christian. Okay. Um, but when we get together as, a, as, a, as an estate to clean the dam side and have a bri afterwards, I would do that. It's not labeled. It's not called a, spiritual um, thing or work together it's called a community thing that's fine i think we saw that happen fairly well under the whole looting thing rudy where people of all walks of life got together to protect their yeah communities now that that we should be part of that we should do that we should do Good. So, yeah. Okay. I think we kind of, I'm tired of talking. <laughs> so I'm going to end the recording.